I went down the archiving rabbit hole. I tried my hardest not to, but of course I eventually did. My parents have a lot of VHS recordings from my childhood, and those tapes aren't going to last forever. Knowing how damp houses in England are, I'm amazed they've lasted this long. So a few years ago, I bought them VHS digitising gear and left them to it. Of course they couldn't do it. Their laptop wasn't powerful enough and they didn't know which settings to use, so I was like, fine, I'll do it. So they handed me everything, I set it up, whacked the digitising program up to maximum quality and was on my merry way, happy to spend as little time as possible on the project. But I couldn't leave it alone, could I? Because that program, even at maximum quality, still makes VHS tapes 25 frames a second. I was very tempted to ignore this, accepting that this would be the best I was going to be able to do with the equipment that I had. Yet I noticed the digitising program showed these recordings in 50fps, and it was only when I rendered it at maximum settings that it discarded half of them. So somewhere on my PC there had to be a 50fps recording of these VHS tapes. And if these existed, then what a shame it would be to not use them. And I found them. Massive 25GB files for each VHS tape. This is what I wanted. The highest quality recordings from the VHS tapes possible, with the equipment I had. The only problem was, all these recordings were interlaced. In case you don't know what interlacing is, interlacing is pure evil, and since undertaking this digitising project it has become the bane of my life. Here is what an interlaced frame looks like. You see that zigzagging? That's because every image is actually two. Each line is alternating between one and then the other. This was some smart person's way of getting 50 frames a second out of 25 frames a second. And now we're paying the price, because no matter what you do with this image file, you can never really get two full quality images out of it again. But the more effort you're willing to invest, the closer you'll get. The simplest way of deinterlacing is to use Bob, which makes two half resolution images out of every interlaced frame. It's as simple as it sounds. It isn't very clever, but it's reasonably effective. I found EEDI2's results to look slightly better, but also it was so much slower that I couldn't justify using it. I had over 60 VHS tapes to get through here. Then I looked to Topaz Video AI, which has its own deinterlacing option. This on its own was way too blobby for my liking, though adding some artificial grain helped disguise this as being extra quality. I think all Topaz programs provide the same sort of service, which is not the best quality results, but the best you can get with minimal effort. For instance, all I had to do here was to tick interlaced and it did the rest automatically. Can you see? No! Good. But I wanted better, and I did find better, and from a free program. To cut a very long and boring story short, everybody online thinks the best deinterlacer is QTGMC. To use this deinterlacer, I had to learn to use another program called AVI Synth. Or rather, a visual version of it called Hybrid, which is still as janky as hell to use. But I've created a text file with a load of steps, and if I follow that, then it seems to work. I'm going to say now that I saw a lot of people recommending that you use QTGMC to deinterlace, but even this isn't perfect, and at stock settings it sharpens the result way too much, adding halos to everything. I'm going to warn you in case you're following in my footsteps. Either manually set sharpness to zero, or consider experimenting with dehaloing algorithms. Whatever you do will degrade the quality in some way. Pick your poison. So with all that done, I was ready to go. Only not quite. Some viewers on YouTube were quick to point out another flaw with my recordings, telling me I needed to use TBC. TBC is time-based correction, which means that every frame of a VHS tape has all its lines synced up. You see that wavy, shimmery look of this footage? That's because I'm not using TBC. I assumed there would be some digital way of doing this, but apparently not. You can get specialised equipment, which you can plug into your VHS player to do it, or you can simply buy a much better VHS player that already has support for it, and is likely better in every other way as well. I mean, it's all old tech, how much could it possibly cost? 300 euros plus import duty now that England's left the EU? This is why I didn't want to go down this rabbit hole. But did I buy it? Yes, of course I did. I hate myself. So I got this ridiculously expensive bit of cutting edge technology from 30 years ago. And it was black and white. The quality of the image was much better, it was square rather than jiggly, thanks to TBC, but it was in black and white. And this is the problem with old tech. I was very much alone with this. Nobody to ask for help, and only myself to blame for getting into this situation, and all those YouTube commenters. So I had no idea what to do. I bought loads of different cables and software, but the result was always black and white. I tried plugging it into TVs around the house to see if it was something to do with my PC's cables that were doing it. Nope, still all black and white. I tried poking all those buttons on the VHS player. Still nothing. And then, a miracle. I accidentally kicked that damn VHS player and it started playing in colour. A miracle! I happily recorded off a few VHS tapes in super high quality and in colour, and then it randomly went black and white halfway through one of the recordings again. 
and no, kicking it didn't work this time. So I decided to try and clean it, even though it looked very clean in the first place. So all the usual advice applies here, have it disconnected from the mains, preferably for a while. Don't touch the electrical bits because they can store electricity for quite some time. I'm too afraid to test how long exactly. Don't use a cotton bud because fibres from it stick to the machine. So I essentially stripped the player naked and rubbed every knob I could find with a folded piece of paper dipped in methylated spirits. Although there are some online who will claim that other spirits are better because impurities can degrade the machine and all that. It's like rabbit holes within rabbit holes within rabbit holes here. So look, the only thing a shop around here supplied was methylated spirits. So I went and used methylated spirits. I found zero black residue on most of the VHS player, but on one of the metal spindly things, there was a bit of black soot around the bottom. I wasn't hopeful that this was the cause of all my problems, but it was, and it worked. And after cleaning my VHS player, I had myself a fully working color VHS player with TBC support. You think, me being an upscaling addict, that I'd be all over enhancing this stuff, but no. I want to preserve what's there as it is, because I know, as much as I want to upscale it now, that upscalers in 5-10 to ten years time will be far better than what I can do with it now. My goal right now is to preserve what's already there, and as faithfully as possible. So ideally, after ripping the VHS tape off and deinterlacing it, I'd immediately store these files in the best settings possible to preserve as much of the detail as I can. But I've opted for another stage in between, and that's to put all these files into Vegas, which is the video editing software that I'm most familiar with. And that's because there's always so much tweaking to do to these VHS tapes. Sometimes the audio is out of sync, other times there's a fuzzy bit that I wanted to delete out and it's much easier using Vegas's graphical interface than it is to enter numbers into a program like Handbrake. So while many people like to up the saturation of video files, I found myself turning it down for these VHS recordings because otherwise the reds and greens were particularly garish. I do up the contrast in some scenes because it looks much better than the murky browns that VHS recordings seem to think are black. But there was one particularly nasty artifact that deinterlacing had introduced, and it's these distinct zigzags across the image, which don't just look nasty, but massively inflate the file sizes as well. So like most of this process, I did a Google search for the problem, and it revealed a botched solution, discussed in a forum somewhere 10 years ago. Conveniently, this solution was done in the same editing software that I was using. Do you know what convolution kernel is? No, I don't either, and I don't care. I just know it lets you skew the pixels on a grid in some way, and by some miracle, this all but eradicates the nasty zigzagging I was encountering. It adds some blur as well, but if I sharpen the result, then somehow it retains the sharpness of the original, but doesn't reintroduce the zigzagging. Another much needed miracle. After all this, I batch rendered all the chapters in Vegas at ridiculously high settings, preserving the resolution and aspect ratio as best as I could. You know those overkill PC components like the Ryzen 7950X and Intel 3900K? The sort where you ask what they're actually for. This is the kind of thing they're for. All 32 processor threads have been working around the clock to get this project done. When I'm sleeping, it can get about three entire VHS tapes deinterlaced using QTGMC. It can denoise and encode three hours of SD footage into AV1 or HEVC in about three hours. I'm applying super sophisticated and demanding calculations to each and every frame of this project. Never have I been so happy to be working with sub-HD quality footage. Most of the time I feel like my PC's potential is being wasted. It'll get my video renders done in about half an hour and then it spends the rest of the time at about 10% usage. Yet while I'm doing a project like this, it is being maxed out. This project gobbles up whatever I throw at it. Although, in a way, the faster my PC is, the harder it is for me to keep up. Right now it's already requiring hours of my time every day just to keep things fed and moving, otherwise I feel like I'm the bottleneck. I've got editing a three hour tape down to about one hour, which I'm proud of, but it's still a huge job to keep track of every tape at every stage of the process, and I've wasted months experimenting with settings and in finding the ideal setups to use. I feel like I'm past the worst of it, but it will only take the discovery of another button that improves the quality in some way to make me consider starting it all over again. I have power limited my processor to 150 watts, firstly because it helps me to keep up with it, but mainly because it's far more power efficient than when it's at 300 watts. I also do it because I dislike the idea of my processor running at 100 degrees hot 24 hours a day at 100% load, especially with my poor airflow, courtesy of Fluffykins. Please don't piss yourself again. So here I am. I've digitized my VHS tapes, all at super high settings, and now they're sat on my computer. What now? And this was the biggest dilemma that I faced. After all this work, after going down all those rabbit holes, was I really content with crushing all these recordings down to small file sizes? Or am I going to bite the bullet and have terabytes of VHS recordings on my PC forevermore? There's no easy answer to this. So here's what I've done. I've shrunk each clip down to a tiny file size. I've trimmed off the shimmery edges, I've denoised the footage, everything I can do to make the files as small as possible. 
this 7 minute video clip isn't even 30 megabytes large. And I'd say it's still retained about 95% of the quality, which is more than enough for everybody who will want to watch it. Each VHS comes to about 700 megabytes in size, so the entire backup will easily fit on a 64 gigabyte memory stick. Because you know what makes a backup bad? It's if it's difficult to back up. Stuff gets broken, stuff gets lost, so I hope that by making the entire thing so small that it can easily fit on everyone's laptops and memory sticks, that it's maximising this archive's chance of being preserved at least somewhere. But don't worry, because I've also bought two 2 terabyte hard drives, which I'll store all the original VHS rips on. In the future, when technology gets better, there may be a better way of deinterlacing all this stuff. I'll also keep all my Vegas files on there, which preserves all the work I've done to split all these raw recordings up into chapters and stuff. This way, should there be some massive breakthrough, I can just return to these hard drives and to easily improve these recordings with minimal work from myself. This entire project has cost me hundreds and hundreds more in electricity bills. It has taken hundreds of hours of my time, and as of making this video I'm only part way through the archiving process. I knew that jumping down this rabbit hole would do this to me. I hate how many people tell me to do this how few have the knowledge to help me once I've done it, and I hate myself for having jumped down there in the first place, so this video is hopefully a handy guide for anybody following in my footsteps who feels utterly alone and who, like me, has desperately trawled through endless ancient forum posts in search of answers for problems which I feel alone in having to deal with. I suppose the big takeaway from all this is, it's all a compromise. Your time, your effort, the quality of the recordings, even the best techniques come with compromises. Do you cut out every dodgy frame by hand? Do you manually tweak the sharpness settings for every scene, depending on lighting levels and recording quality? This sort of rabbit hole has no end. It's diminishing returns all the way, and plenty of people to criticise you for what you've done but unwilling to help you do better. My advice to you is, don't go down the rabbit hole in the first place, but if you do, then it's better to set your standards lower and to complete the whole process than it is to set your standards too high and to burn yourself out halfway. Be careful.